Well, hello everyone. I'm Jim Dempsey, and it's great to be here with you today. Uh, I've, I have the privilege of um, joining uh, with uh, Dr. Alan Unruh, and it's a blessed opportunity for me to be here today. Um, my background a little bit is I have had the privilege of being in ministry and being in the area of development and fundraising for the last 36 years, and it's been an extreme privilege. I was a product of uh, an organization called Campus Crusade for Christ. I came to the Lord as a college student, as did my wife when we were students, and we uh, both decided to go into full-time ministry with Campus Crusade for Christ. And aside from 18 months when I was on campus, I served uh, my first assignment in an administrative role was in the area of development. I went to California to serve in uh, Campus Crusades headquarters at the time, was in California, and uh, took a role in the Office of Development. And at that time, I had no idea what development was. I thought maybe it was land development, had something to do with uh, buildings, but then I found that it really had a lot to do with building relationships with people. And uh, when I first heard that development officers, uh, the life expectancy is 18 months of a development officer. And it, uh, it, it scared me in the beginning, but I knew that God was true to the calling of being in development and uh, developing relationships with people. Um, I had the privilege of having some mentors, some early mentors who shared with me just how important it was to focus more on relationships than on the dollars. And that was probably the best lesson that I could have ever gotten was to focus in on those relationships because I know there's people who came in at the same time that I did and focused in on the dollars and they they lost a lot over the years just because they um, they cared more about what was coming in than uh, about building the relationship and that's the privilege that we have those people in ministry and especially in this area of development and fundraising is the opportunity that we have to share with people what God is doing through a wide variety of organizations, whether it be Campus Crusade for Christ or whether it be an incredible ministry like Alpha Center, we've got the opportunity to share what God is doing with other fellow believers. I always say that uh, I lived 30 years in the Washington, D.C. area, and uh, there's a, a, a um, uh, what we refer to as the beltway, the highway that goes around the capital. And uh, there's people that will drive two, three hours sometimes to go to work every day, uh, either, either end. And I watch those people and I think they go in and they have their lives. Uh, they will leave early in the morning, sit at their desk for eight hours, get back in their car, wolf down the food, go to bed and start the process over. They're looking for meaning in life. And I have the privilege of being able to share with them what God is doing and how they can participate in those opportunities that God's presented for them. So it's really an exciting opportunity that we have. Alan, how about you? Tell us a little bit about your story. Well, I probably learned a little bit about development through the School of Hard Knocks. Mm, amen. Uh, shoot from the hip type of a program. And, and uh, we put an ad in uh, way back when, 37 years ago, in the, to uh, abortion information. And, and the phone's ringing off the hook right off the bat, 150 calls first month wasn't long as costing me 3000 a month just for pregnancy tests that I was paying for. And I'm just a kind of country chiropractor. And so we started calling churches, little churches, telling them, our phones are ringing off the hook. We're helping save babies. Uh, could we speak in your church? <laughs> so evidently, some of them uh, let us do that. And then we're telling our story and said, we need help. We need counselors. We need people to donate. We can't afford all these expenses and we were in the basement of our house at the time and that's where the rubber meets the road we have hell's angels coming to the house our kids were age two to age 12 at the time and uh 
it's just grown and we just got used to telling the story and we did about everything wrong with like uh, Thomas Edison who said I know 10,000 ways that won't work uh, <laughs> before he invented the light bulb right. you learn and you you uh, you re debrief why people give why they don't and you build relationships with Absolutely. people Absolutely. Yeah, when you, you never lose when you focus in on that friendship aspect. You focus in on what has motivated individuals to participate. Find out what makes people weep and pound the table. Now for me, fast forward 36 years and I have the privilege of serving as the Associate Director of Development for the Campus Ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ and I have the privilege of raising over 28 million dollars a year for Campus wow. Crusade for Christ. Uh, everything from direct mail to foundations to mid-level donors to major donors, uh, putting on events. I've had the privilege of of taking part in helping to run over 2,500 dinners, banquets, uh, events wow. over those 36 years. So it definitely has given me a lot of uh, experience and I enjoy that. Over this last year, I've really, um, for me, when our events shut down with the pandemic, having to move to a virtual option meant we had to pivot from something that I was so comfortable with and knew so well, 36 years of doing in-person live events to all of a sudden go virtual. We had to pivot quickly and, and learn, but I believe we were so successful because we did all the basics, the same basics, which was find out human nature, listen to what, what people are interested in, what motivates them, what encourages them. And so I've also this year had the privilege, God provided an opportunity for me to start a YouTube channel called Development Effectiveness Strategies. I had 36 years of wanting to uh, give back to ministries and I've had the privilege of giving back to ministries like Alpha Center and countless other ministries, whether it be Fellowship of Christian Athletes or, or pregnancy centers all around the country and I've had the opportunity to help them and give back that knowledge and experience but now in creating a YouTube channel uh, I now have a library of 50 plus videos over the last six or seven months that we've been able to put together just taking all that knowledge and putting that into YouTube videos and enjoying that so it's been a real privilege uh, from from me Alan, when we talk about relationships, what are the things that you have learned most about relationships, especially uh, building relationships with major donors? Well, my, uh, I, I look at it from a broad perspective. I'm a big picture type of a thinker. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, some people will test the waters, like the Bible says, you, uh, if you trust you in a little, I'll give you more. And we had one guy give five bucks or he'd bring just small gifts mm -hmm. over the years. We thought, this is really weird. <laughs> and then all of a sudden this woman gave 100000 We thought, what in the world? Where did that money come from? But we were always gracious to her. She loved the Alpha mm -hmm. Center. <laughs> so you just don't know. You think you read people. <laughs> but right. uh, it's just that you're faithful all the time with every customer. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll give... Uh, like you said, legacy is everything in life. You can give it to the kids who sometimes fight over it, but they realize, I want to make a difference in the world when I meet my maker. That's right. And so people have an opportunity to give to a cause that really makes a difference. Absolutely. And so that's kind of my focus. Mm, <laughs> my focus neat. just talking to that them. Sometimes I use crude techniques, like at a banquet I'd say, I want you to know we're, our goal is to raise 500000 and we have the money. And they'll all applaud. <laughs> the bad news is still in your wallets. <laughs> <laughs> but if you lighten it up a little bit sure. that we need the Absolutely. money, and this is what we need it for, Absolutely. then God loves a cheerful yep. giver. Absolutely. And so yeah. you try to create that humor yes. in a way right. that... Don't give till it hurts, give till it feels good. <laughs> right. And that type of attitude, right. it all comes yeah, down absolutely. to attitude. Yeah, it really does. It really does. Uh, the 
Probably a few of the biggest mistakes that we make with major donors is number one, we don't listen. Uh, what we really should be doing is we should be listening more than we talk. Unfortunately, what happens is, especially if we meet with a major donor, the first thing we want to do is to begin talking, sharing with them what we do and how we do it and how they can give to our organization. And, and it's equivalent to cramming our ideas and our thoughts down their throat. I've learned over the years that the best thing that we can do is really start with asking them questions about themselves. Get them talking about themselves. What makes them weep and pound the table? What is it that they're interested in? And I like to find out where do our paths converge? What, are we doing any things that will help them accomplish or fulfill what they, what the passion or burden that God has placed on their hearts? I believe that every believer when they come to Christ uh, has God it puts a, a certain burden or a passion on their hearts. And I've got to just find out what that passion is. If it's our organization, terrific. I've got some great opportunities I want to direct them towards. But if it's another organization, I would rather direct them to that other organization so that we can really fulfill what God had created them to do. And if, you know, Campus Crusade for Christ, we don't, um, are not specifically pro-life. And so if I had someone that came in and said, I would, I, I would like to find out how I can be involved in a pro-life movement, I'd have to say, well, Campus Crusade doesn't specifically do that. But Alpha Center, let me introduce you to, uh, to Alan and Leslie Unruh in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, that's doing an amazing job in protecting the sanctity of human life. And so uh, I, I like to find out what is it that they're interested in, see how our paths will converge. And secondly, I've found that we really don't want to take our partners for granted. Unfortunately, what we tend to do is we tend to treat our partners, or that would be prospective financial partners or current partners, uh, we like to treat them like ATMs, unfortunately. An ATM is never important until we need it. And then an ATM is very important. We get that money and then what happens? We leave the ATM and don't think about an ATM again until we need money again. And that's where we are with our partners. And it's so sad when we get to that point where we don't value the relationships, we just value the dollars. And our partners see that. They know if we don't care about them, but they do know when we legitimately care about them. I, I have uh, individuals who have become significant partners and frankly significant friends as a result of me just caring about them. And you know, I've, I've directed people to other organizations than mine, and then they come back and say, thank you for connecting me with that organization. Hey, tell me again what your organization does, because I think I'd like to help. Because they care about me, and they care about the relationship, because I cared about them. So it's, uh, it's so, so important that we value that relationship. Well, I love the idea of consistency. Uh, you know, you think about $5 a month for, uh, for a lot of years, and it's the same way. I, one of the privileges that I have is not only do I raise money for, for Crew or Campus Crusade for Christ corporately, I have to raise my own personal support, and I've been able to do that since 1984. And I, I look back at some of those individuals. I have 125 individuals who give to me on a regular basis. And many of them have never missed a month in 36 years. And, uh, it's, it is just amazing how many gifts those individuals have given. And I believe the reason that not only have they given that long is because they're committed to the cause and committed to what we're doing, but it's consistency. I have probably, I could count on one hand how many monthly letters I've missed over the last 36 years. I send a letter consistently to those individuals 
telling them how their money's used. And reporting back to our partners are so important. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we make as organizations is that we don't report back uh, certainly, generally, generationally, if you track it back, certainly the greatest generation, um, they, they gave because it was the right thing to do and they did it and they didn't need reporting back. But ever since the baby boom generation and moving on to uh, Gen X and then millennials and Gen Z, we've really found that it is those individuals want to hear how their money's used, whether it be, it be that it was just a good investment, I want to know how my investment did, or the fact that they just want to be excited about what God is doing as yeah. a result of their gifts. It's so important. What, how do you and there's that? another rule, thanking people. Oh. We had a woman gave $1,000. She's never given 1000 for anything before. We didn't, th didn't thank her for a week or 10 days, and her husband said, they didn't appreciate my gift. Mm. And call them yes. within 24 hours is a rule. Absolutely. And so <laughs> our, our, our director <laughs> went to her house, she talked about all the organic foods she had in the basement and, and storing <laughs> up for, and, and developed a relationship and interest in her. But then they gave after that regularly, but all those little things make a big difference yeah, they do. to people. They do. I, I always I use the analogy that uh, I learned uh, how to thank through at my eighth, eighth grade graduation. When I graduated, my parents had a party for me, had all of our friends come over, and I received a lot of gifts, and I enjoyed it very much, getting all that money and counting all the money. But the next day, my mom said to me, it's time to start writing thank you notes. And you would have thought she, uh, she had asked me to sever one of my limbs. It was, uh, <laughs> it was it, and I felt like that after writing all those thank yous. I, I was as dramatic as a teenager could be, and you know, my hand is hurting and everything else. But I learned a valuable lesson there because the feedback I got was just tremendous. And I, I went ahead and instilled that into my kids and they enjoyed it as much as I did at the time, uh, which I'm being sarcastic in that they didn't enjoy it. But now they've learned to write thank you notes and they are very good thank you note writers. Unfortunately, we see that too often. I heard a percentage yeah. recently that was something like 89% of, of partners say that they never get a thank you from their the wow. nonprofit that they give to, which is astounding when I think about that. It, it really breaks my heart. And, and even, Alan, I appreciate so much your comment about, uh, and I have the same, out the door in 24 is my, my thank yep. you note as well too. It, it's just, it, it's remarkable how I see centers and nonprofit organizations wait two, three, four weeks, you know, because the accountant only writes, you know, a, a receipt once a month. So we have to wait right once a month. And, and it's just, that's the wrong reason. We ought to be changing our procedures to work better with our partners. That's one of the things that I encourage with all the dinners that I work with. I encourage those individuals, the leadership and board to call the next day. It is so hard because you're exhausted from the night before, but it's one of the best exercises you could do. There's no easier call that a staff member or a board can make than to call and thank someone for a gift. You're not asking them for money, you're just okay. saying, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, thank you for your gift of $1,000. Let me tell you how we're gonna use that, it's gonna make a difference. Well, even Jesus healed 10 lepers, only one thanked him, he said, right. Weren't there nine others? <laughs> right, exactly. Now you think yeah. you can heal. It's a principle, We've but it's a principle we need to learn yeah. from. Yeah, it is. And it makes a big difference in yeah. people's lives. Yeah. And whether they, by their fruits you shall know them, when they see the fruits of the ministry at a dinner, or they hear from somebody who survived an abortion, right. they see value. Then they see, wow, nobody else I donate is saving lives and changing lives. Right, right. We're doing both. And the changing the life is what's the long, Hall, the hard work. Right. You can't just say, don't do this, but who's there for them to love them through it, deal with all the problems they did, life skill classes, all the things we teach people. Right. 
And Absolutely. it doesn't cost them anything. That's right. They, but they have to earn it. So they learn self-respect, dignity. Resp That's right. <laughs> responsibility. That's right. Yeah. Responsibility yeah. is the key. Yeah. Well, I know some of you leaders are thinking, wow, how do I communicate with literally hundreds of individuals that I have on my mailing list? Well, I like to focus in on what I refer to as the critical few. That's the 20% that bring in 80% of your dollars. I learned that early on with our own personal support and I, I transferred that, brought it over to our organization. And that someone said, if all you did was make a difference and focus in on the lives of those 20% that bring in 80% of your dollars, your organization, your ministry would be revolutionized. And it was, it was everything that people said. Now, some people will have said to me over the years, well, Jim, I, th does that mean I'm treating people differently? And I said, well, guess what? Jesus treated people differently. They said, wow, Jesus treated everyone the same. Did he? Did he treat people the same? He certainly ministered to the masses, but when he got tired, who did he go off with? He went off with the 12, and then even within the 12, Peter, James, and John, he spent a little bit more time with. Who are our disciples in a sense, and who are Peter, right. James, and John? Who are those individuals that you can develop a, a deeper relationship with those people? Uh, again, you will be using a, a criteria on giving. Now, you know, some people have said to me, well, what about the widow's might? Yes, you need to love the widow's might, and you need to love the 80% that only give 20% of your money. But what I'm saying is you've only got a limited amount of time. You need some criteria. And that giving is a way of, of developing a criteria that will help you to focus in on that critical few and it will revolutionize what you do. Now another mistake that people make is that they're always looking for the big gift, that, that home run gift. If I could just meet Mr. and Mrs. Megabucks, if I could meet them, they're gonna solve all my problems yeah. and I won't, I won't have any more problems after that. Well, number one, it's so tough to get in to see Mr. and Mrs. Megabucks. Chances are, if you get in there, they may not even like what you're doing. But frankly, I'm not sure, even if I got that gift, if I really would want that, to be honest, because my trust then all of a sudden shifts away from the Lord, possibly right. onto Mr. and Mrs. Megabox. And, and I don't want that. I want my trust to be in the Lord. This is an, a, an incredible opportunity we have to raise money and to develop relationships with people. God has given us a unique opportunity here. And I know for some of you, raising money and development is a necessary evil. You think, oh, I don't want to do it, but I have to do it. Oh, I, I look at it as a privilege that God has given me, and I just, I love it, because it allows me to trust God for big things. If, if God wanted to, he could say to me, Jim, sit on the couch, and I, I could just answer the door, and people could come up to the door and say, I don't know why, but I'm supposed to give you a lot of money and I could take the money, but that's not how God works. God wants us to go out there, to step out in faith, to stick our toe in the, in the Jordan River, so to speak, and, and trust God for something big. And, and he does do that and he does it often. And so I believe that can come through a lot of different people and oftentimes doesn't come through that mega bucks person. And if it does, if, if six months later or a year later that person decides not to give a second gift, then I'm in trouble. I've been devastated yeah. by that. And I've seen missionaries who have to raise three, four, five, six, seven thousand dollars a month. And someone says, yeah, I'll give you five thousand dollars a month. No problem, I'll do it. And they do it for two years. And all of a sudden, after two years, then they're devastated because they've just lost $5,000 a month. And so it, it shouldn't surprise you that really, I'll take, you know, I would rather have five people give me $5,000 for $25,000 than one $25,000 gift. Now, don't get me wrong, I'd love to have both, and I will try and get both. 
But if I have to choose between the two, I'll take I'll take the five at twenty five uh, every time. So you know. and the big donors get hit 20, 30, 40 times a day. They do. So they get cold to it. After a while, I don't. There's a million good causes. They are. And how do you get yours at the forefront of everything they might want to donate to? And we had a big donor once. He lost fifty million dollars. Mm. All of a sudden, his whole life changed. Uh, we can't count on that, like you just said. Right. <laughs> He's by a relative. I mean, yeah. Yeah. it just it happens. Yeah. yeah, I know. It's you know, unfortunately, that happens all too often. The people who relate to us best are generally entrepreneurs because those people have been in our place. They've had to raise money themselves from investors. And when we come in and we are asking them for money, they relate to that. But unfortunately, entrepreneurs are also people who one minute they're on the top of the world with their company, the next they're, they're filing for bankruptcy. And then two years later, they're at the top of the world again. And that happens all too often. And so uh, we, we just need to understand that our dependency really is on the Lord. From that standpoint. So. Well, another opportunity uh, or another mistake that tends to ma be made is that we tend to focus just on one income source. And too often I've seen small organizations, especially small ministries, go down one path and then find out that it's a, it's a, it's a blind alley. Uh, for example, too many organizations will follow the path of foundations Getting money from foundations is extremely difficult. It takes years to get in line with a foundation just to get a first gift from that. But I can tell you how many organizations will follow that path and, and find it a big mistake. Or others will put all their time and effort into one dinner or one banquet or a walkathon. I believe it's so important to look for multiple income streams. First of all, the best income stream, of course, is with personal relationships with people, individuals giving gifts to your organization. A major donor gift is, is all part of that relationship building that we have with individuals. It is critical that we can get that. I'll give you an example of the percentages. So many nonprofits love to rely on writing letters to people in the mail. But a, direct, a typical direct mail response, even a good direct mail response, is about 2%. Now you add to that a phone call and it can jump to 25 or 30%. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, did you get the letter I sent? Have you been able to make a decision about that? You can get to 25 to 30%. But if you go face to face with someone, your response rate is 50% or better. So it's important that you, just as in your investments, you don't spend too much money in one sector of international stocks or in the, in, in, into oil and gas or, or other areas, it's the same way with our development fundraising area. We don't want to spend too much time just in one area. I've seen organizations where 50, 60, 70 percent of their income come from a banquet or a dinner that they do every year. And that's a big mistake. I don't believe that anything more than 30 percent of your income should come from an event like that. So making sure that you're diversifying your income streams is so important. Well, Alan, you and I are going to surprise uh, our viewers by saying this, but you and I are up there in age, both of us. I know that's going to surprise people. I thought you were a young um, whippersnapper. <laughs> but one of the things that we have found is that, especially as we start to get older, and of course our partners are exactly the same way, they start to think about their legacy, their future, where they're going, in, in life and are they going to make a difference? You know, we spend, uh, go back to the old Bob Buford book, some of you may be old enough to remember that, the halftime book, where you uh, move from success to significance. We spend our first um, 30, 40 years 
focusing in on success and then you, you somewhere in life you turn the corner and you want to make a difference and, and you want to make a significant impact. You want to leave a legacy. And we need to be thinking about our partners that want to leave a legacy. It's so many of the studies, and we were talking about this before we came on air, is that so many of, of organizations focus in on current giving. That's people's ability essentially to give out of their income. But the real money to be found is in assets, is in net worth of individuals. Many people right now, me included, are really living in their retirements and their assets are in their home and other properties and things that they, they own. It could be stocks, it could be appreciated securities. There's a lot of the money in the assets and, and for some people they may be leaving that to the next generation, but there's others that don't wanna leave it maybe to their kids or they would like to leave it that money to the kingdom so that it has an internal, an eternal impact. And so we've got to really make sure that we don't make a mistake and just focus in on income giving, but we also ask people to give of their assets. Have we asked people, when was the last time you asked people, have you included Alpha Center or your pregnancy center uh, in your will? Have, have you asked them if they've done that? Or do they have some stocks or appreciated securities that they would be willing to transfer over to your pregnancy center? So those, that kind of giving, legacy giving, is important. Alan? Plus those capital gains tax might go up to 40% or whatever. A ministry doesn't have to pay that. Right. When they gift it, so you're able to give it to the government, which may squander it, or you give it to a ministry. Right. What a peace of mind they have. <laughs> Absolutely, right. You think right. about that. You think yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. And for some of you, some of the things that Alan just said maybe went right over your head. You're like, wow, I, I, I couldn't even begin to talk to someone about that because that is just so beyond me. Well, I've got to ask you, do you maybe have someone who's on your board or, or a, even a, a donor or someone connected with your organization that does have some, have some experience and understanding in financial matters and you could direct your partner. All you have to do is bring it up. Would you be interested in talking with our financial advisor? I'll be honest, I don't know what I'm talking about in this area, but I'd like to introduce you to Fred Jones, who's on our board, and he does understand that, and I'd love to connect you with them. We appreciate so much what each and every one of you are doing. You're real heroes out there on the front lines, and it's not easy uh, by any means to raise money for an organization. But I hope today the one lesson that I would learn uh, to convey is that it doesn't have to be a necessary evil. It can be something that you enjoy because of the relationship building in there. And so I pray for you that God would really uh, come to you and be there and encourage you and strengthen you, wrap his arms around you and love you, and, and that you would know that he's going to provide for your resources. And if you need additional help, I'm happy to be there for you. Uh, please feel free to go out to our, my YouTube channel, Development Effectiveness Strategies. Be sure to subscribe, share questions. I've got a weekly uh, broadcast that I call Jim and Java where we answer questions. Be sure to submit questions and certainly share those videos with your colleagues and friends. So don't be afraid to submit uh, and share and of course subscribe. So thank you so much for your time today.